bits, bytes, and barrels. And I want to uh, just raise your awareness, uh, the wave of digital change, we've already had some hints at it uh, from uh, Ron and others, but the wave of digital change that's uh, impacting the oil and gas industry worldwide. And I want to uh, highlight for you um, some research I've been carrying out uh, about where the pipeline industry specifically sits in the context of digital innovation, um, because I'm looking for a hero. Uh, my research shows that there is no heroes yet in oil and gas, in pipelines specifically. And there's a place in the marketplace for heroes. Uh, heroes that inspire, heroes that lead, heroes that set the pace, that attract the next generation of talent. And one of the ways to do that is through digital innovation. Next generation employees, we've heard about them. They grew up with a smartphone in the crib. Not, not in, didn't get that in grade school, it was in the crib. Uh, so they're looking for that inspired place to work where they can bring some of the talent, skills, know-how they've developed from birth into the workplace. So today's discussion is about, so I call it bits, bites, and barrels. I might have called it bits and bites at one point. I might have had another presentation years ago called barrels. But bits and bites and barrels are now closely intertwined. I've already heard a little bit about me. I'm, a, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm what's called a retired partner from Deloitte. That's a technical and legal term for tax purposes because I'm far too young to retire, as many of you have already told me. Um, and the reason I got interested in this industry was because of something you probably already saw in the news. Uh, what are the top, just show, if you might know, shout out the answers. What are the top six largest companies in the world by market cap today? Apple, Amazon, Facebook, yeah. Guess what, if you went back to 2014, would you see any oil companies in that list? Yeah, pretty much uh, top f two of the top five for sure, ExxonMobil, PetroChina. So the oil industry used to be the game and, and we've dropped out of that game. So digital is now the largest industry in the world and oil and gas is understandably cautious about um, investing too much in digital innovation because after mm -hmm. all, we work in a hard industry, physical, steel, vapors, liquids, all of the stuff that uh, Silicon Valley doesn't have to deal with, we have to deal with on a day-by-day -day basis. But what some of the innovators are out there have discovered is that merging those two together actually creates fantastic pathways for the future. My message to young people, my Gen X colleague at the back of the room, this is the best time to be in the oil and gas industry. The industry is about to go through the greatest wave of change alongside the power industry, the gas industry. None of us, unfortunately, I'm gonna to be too old to see the end of it, but this is the greatest wave of change. One of the most fundamental industries that we deal with worldwide is going to go through in our lifetimes. It hasn't, doesn't happen often. It happens when we transition from whale oil to coal, when we transition from coal to oil, when we transition from wood to whale. Those were the big transitions of energy. And we're right now at the precipice. We're about to embark on another fantastic wave of change. As I say, there's not a more exciting time to be part of this industry. Now, let me just give you a sense as to what is it that's, uh, and where digital is having an impact on oil and gas. There are four principal vectors. Just kind of put this to give you kind of a nice big picture sense of this. Vector number one is supply. Supply of oil and gas is skyrocketing. The reason for this is artificial intelligence, machine learning, and other tools like this are unlocking <coughs> reserves after reserve after reserve at a pace that the oil and gas industry is unused to. The IEA estimates that the artificial intelligence machine learning will add fully 5% to global reserves of hydrocarbons. What is 5%? It's 500 billion barrels. What is that on a sort of a consumption basis? 12 years supply globally at 100 million barrels per day. We can't burn that and live in our two, two degree target within the Paris Climate Accord. Where's that oil gonna come from? Shale. It's gonna come from shale because shale has a different decline curve from the conventional basins. And when artificial intelligence will shift that decline curve up to make it look and behave more and more like uh, conventional basins and that will unlock enormous reserves of oil and gas. Where are those shale resources located? Principally south of the border. 
back to, again, our conversation from today about pipelines and our inability to get our product to market, this is a, uh, should be a real wake-up call for the oil and gas industry. The biggest market south of the border is very close to becoming thoroughly independent of Canadian oil and gas. Thoroughly. Sitting on oceans and oceans of it, which they are now feverishly exporting. They're quickly becoming the largest exporter of oil and gas in the world. So supply is going up. All things being equal, you shove supply into a market, price goes down. We are on the highest cost product in oil sands. Our oil reserves are very costly. So next big vector for, oiling, for our, um, where digital is affecting oil and gas is driving our costs um, down. That's why you see the oil and gas industry investing so heavily in trying to extract costs out of the industry. Third principal vector for digital is it raises productivity up. If we could squeeze just a tiny, tiny bit more of utilization out of our existing pipeline assets, we could actually find another 100,000 barrels uh, per day of transportation capacity down to the United States. It's just hidden in you know, the way the pipelines currently operate today. Too much uh, when we do transitions from, uh, from uh, start to stop and back again. It's just too much time spent in doing that sort of stuff. Incremental capacity, improving productivity. And the fourth big vector, and the biggest one, the sleeper, is on the demand side. You can see it in Tesla. At the very same time as in Toronto, there's a newspaper article that says, Kinder Morgan um, pipeline uh, decision by the federal court. On the other side of the newspaper is Tesla, as Walmart announcing that they're about to purchase 30 more of Tesla's uh, electric heavy hauler trucks. And we wonder why Torontonians don't understand the oil and gas industry. They see sexy um, trucking purchases by Walmart. Walmart's the biggest retailer in Canada, closely followed by Amazon, I suspect. So those are the four big vectors. Think about that. Supply up, demand down. Demand down. Demand will go down because connected, shared, autonomous, and electric transportation. It'll take 25 to 50% of the barrel out of the fossil fuel industry completely. So with those two vectors, everybody else who's in the middle, and that's everyone in this room, and the entire Canadian oil and gas industry, we are now on a treadmill of cost and productivity improvements. And it will run for the rest of your professional and business careers, as long as you're involved in this industry. And that's why I say it's the most exciting time in life. Because this is no more a question of whether we can dig it out of the ground and put it into the market and make money. We actually have to earn our money, finally. We have to finally earn it. So a very, very exciting time. These are the sorts of things that keep pipelines up at night. I think you probably know all about this, but social pressures and carbon footprint and energy demands. And how do we optimize energy consumption for our, our uh, assets? And how do we get our productivity of our, of our pipelines up? And, and how do we reduce our costs? These are the kinds of things that pipeline executives uh, worry about. But when I think about the pipeline of the future, what is that company going to look like? I see it as being highly automated and exceptionally efficient. I see one that attracts talent. People are banging on your door saying, I want to work for you guys. And most importantly, clean and accident free. Same message as you've heard in the room today. This is what makes the pipeline industry um, the pipeline of the future to make it as attractive to the next generation of employees as it possibly can. I went looking for the digital leader of the industry because I have that kind of time. And uh, took a look at um, 63 different pipeline companies. And there's just a partial list. You might see your name up there if you're a pipeline company. And um, my list, my search included visiting every single one of your websites. And then I conducted a media uh, survey looking for pipeline plus keywords like artificial intelligence, digital, digital innovation, blockchain, augmented reality, virtual reality. The words that generations of employees who you're trying to attract to your business uh, would also go looking for. And just to make sure I wasn't being particularly stupid, I contacted some investment analysts in Toronto because I thought there was, an, oh, there was a possibility that I was missing something, that somehow the investment analysts knew that the pipeline industry was incredibly innovative digitally, and I just wasn't getting it. So I asked the investment analysts what they thought, and they said, no, you're right. This industry is not as innovative as it could be. Yes, there's a ton of investment in smart pigs. There's tons of investment in improving the reliability of pipelines. There's great investment interest in improving uh, constructability of pipelines. But in terms of actual digital and innovation in digital, the answer was is no. There is no hero 
of this industry yet. I want to point you to Rio Tinto, just to draw a parallel. Suncor, CNRL, Curl, they're all going to adopt Rio's heavy hauler trucks. Right? We talked about that. Thank you, Ron, for putting that up there, heavy haulers. Did you also know that they have developed the world's first autonomous railroad? They don't just heavily haul the, the ore body out of the mine and then take it to a manually. They have a fully automated train system now in the Pilbara. A robot, the world's lar longest robot, hauls the ore to port. If you go around the world, you can find totally autonomous container ports today. Lights out. I was in Singapore visiting for business, and I was, my hotel looked directly out onto the container facility, and I was fascinated to watch the speed by which the thing operated, the ships coming in and so forth. And darkness came and went, and I thought, oh, well, the lights will all pop up, and I watch it. No, you don't. You don't watch it at night. It's still furiously busy, but there's no lights because there's no people. No people. Their next innovation at Rio will be the ghost ship that will haul your body to market. So they're not just putting the pieces into place where they automate the front end of this business. They're putting the pieces into place to automate the full end-to-end -end of resource extraction. So their vision isn't just how do we make workers more safe in our industry. It's a big emphasis of the conversation here today. Their question is, why do we have people in this business in the first place? It's a bloody good question. I know the reason, uh, the answer to that. I don't know if you read, read the Rio Tinto bumper stickers. Their stickers say, Earth first. We'll mine the other planets later. <laughs> <laughs> That's what autonomous and automation gets for you. What would it mean to be a leader? Let me give you a little framework for how digital gets done. Something you can take back to the office on Wednesday and put it right into practice. Digital is all about data. It's all about data. And the oil and gas industry actually is a big, I mean, the, the product we deal with is so hazardous, we don't even want to be exposed to it. So we, only, we run the industry with data that we have about the industry. Right? You don't, no one wants to be exposed to the product, right? Unlike a car, love it. we all like to be exposed to a car. You want to get in it and hold the wheel and drive around. But people don't like to be exposed to hydrocarbons because of their ha they're hazardous. So we actually run the industry on data. We have always run the industry on data. The industry is very, very, very data intense. The Internet of Things is going to generate enormous quantities of data. It already is. Every single flight, those of you who flew here or, or uh, uh, took a, um, uh, if you come from away, every single flight across North America generates one terabyte of data every single flight. I have a hard time getting my head around a terabyte of data. A terabyte is 300,000 color photographs on your phone. A terabyte of data is 300 CDs stacked up. A terabyte of data is 50,000 trees cut down and turned into paper and printed single-sided. So a terabyte of data is a to kind of use a technical term, it's a shitload of data, right? <laughs> so sensors, sensors are generating an enormous amount of data. And they're getting better and better and better all the time. Next generation, Apple technology. Here's the Apple watch on my, on my wrist. Those of you who have Apple watch, you're carrying a Cray supercomputer on your wrist, and you're using it to tell time. Right? We're going to be able to put sensors on virtually everything. Internet of things. The amount of data coming off these things now so fantastically outstrips the way we've ever managed information in the past that we can no longer use the tools that have, have served us so well to date. NAL Resources, Calgary Oil Company, um, decided to do some investment in robotics and automation and so forth to improve their royalty processing. So just for fun, they went around the company and counted the number of active Excel spreadsheets in use. Would you ha care to hazard a guess as to how many active Excel spreadsheets you'd find in your small oil and gas company. 450,000. Whoa. Yeah. Don't look too closely into the laptops of your own employees. Because I would hazard to guess you'd find that, that kind of volume of activity on Excel uh, in your company, too. 
So to the tools we use the, from the past, not going to work in the future. There's just, too, there's just too much data. Too much data. Excel's not going to do the job. That's the role of artificial intelligence and machine learning. That's why there's so much investment going into that, because of the first phenomenon. You have too much data coming out of these sensors, no way to process it all. You need the AI. The third piece of the puzzle is the robot. If the Internet of Things generates the data and artificial intelligence interprets the data, then robots are going to apply the data and put it to work. And it's not just going to be on the front of the mind. It's, it's, I, I was watching that video of the yellow goods, the diggers, right? All I was thinking of when I was watching that video was those people are actually training the AI engine to properly dig Earth. They're actually not digging Earth. I mean, they're teaching themselves to use the mechanicals, mechanics of it, but the reality is if you're actually, as a human, you control the device, the, the uh, equipment, and you're actually doing the digging, at the same time as you're doing that, you are also, or could be, teaching a robot to do the same job. That's what Tesla is doing with their cars. When you drive a Tesla vehicle, you're not just driving a Tesla vehicle. Your vehicle in Tesla is teaching every other Tesla how to drive. That's how the robots work. They learn from each other. It's called fleet learning. So if you have a machine in your business today and there's a seat in it with a padded chair and they set a holder, things like this, and you're struggling to find talent to fill that seat and you're spending a lot of money training and they, then they quit, another question you might ask is, why am I insisting that a human be the one to operate this piece of equipment? How do I automate this? Hard to believe this, but the world-class AI and robotics capabilities in the world, some of Google's best talent, are in Edmonton. And they don't have enough to do. Don't tell them I told you that. Now, where do we put all this data? There's mountains of it, oceans of it. No company is going to have the horsepower and the storage capacity to house all this stuff. So guess what? It's going to have to sit in cloud computing. It's going to be up in the cloud. If you don't have a cloud strategy today, you're not going to be able to play in this game. So you've got to think about, how do I get my company into cloud? Next big puzzle piece, blockchain. Why is this so interesting? Anybody here drive a Porsche? Any Porsche owners? Ah, one, two, three. So did you know that Porsche next generation cars are all going to be blockchain animals? Yes, no, did not know that, yeah. Did not know that. Guess what? If you buy a Porsche in 2020, it's going to be on blockchain. Why would Porsche do that? Imagine you're at Chinook Center, those of you from Calgary, and you buy something really heavy at Dead Bed Bath & Beyond, and you have to take it down to your car, and it's a really long way, and isn't that a pain in the ass? And wouldn't it be great if you could just give it to the attendant and send them down to your car, and the car door would open, and they could put it into the trunk, and you wouldn't have to give them your keys? Wouldn't that be great? That's what blockchain does. With a smart contract on the phone, you can say to this individual, I authorize you to go down to my car, the car trunk will open, you will put the item in the trunk of the car, the car trunk will close, smart contract closed. Porsche is bringing that to market in 2020. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, it means you can pay for your fuel with blockchain, it means you can pay your road tolls with blockchain, it means you can pay your parking with blockchain. What happens if you take an artificial intelligence engine and you put it on an air conditioner and you then put it onto this structure called blockchain? AI can interpret to tell when the best price to purchase for the air conditioner to run mm -hmm. and it can decide which power to purchase. And it can record all of that as evidence using these blockchain structures. Blockchain gives robots agency. Blockchain gives robots agency. So if you're in the business of oil and gas and you have machines of any kind, and I don't care whether they're a frack spread, if you're a fracking outfit, a heavy hauler, a yellow goods operator, anything at all, blockchain is going to give your equipment agency. You have to think about that. This is why I say it's such an exciting time to be in this industry. The amount of change coming at us is extraordinary. All of this has to sit on a proper ERP platform because of the volume of data. If you don't have a proper ERP platform in your business today, you will definitely be at a competitive disadvantage because all of this infrastructure that I'm talking about here integrates with ERP systems. Next up, Agile. 
Agile is the way and the work that technical people do to build digital things. To give you an idea of how Agile works, Amazon releases 50 million software products to market every year. Now, to give you, put that into perspective, that's only 95 software releases per minute. And in the total amount of time I've been standing here speaking with you, they've issued hundreds of software updates globally into their system. How many of your companies issued a software update at all today? So if you want to play in the digital world, it's working at a different clock speed, different clock speed. So you have to actually create different ways to do things. Many of the large industrial concerns that are finding themselves working in digital, GE and Siemens and so forth, what they've discovered is agile actually creates a fundamentally different company culture. It speeds up, it's more exciting, it's more dynamic, things happen faster. And so if you're going to be working in digital, you, Agile is one of the ways you do it. Companion to that is thinking about the user experience, how people use the technology. How many of you went to the training course to use the app to interact with today's session, by the way? Show of hands, how many took the training course? <laughs> there wasn't a training course, was there? There wasn't a training course. Why do we have yellow goods teaching people how diggers work and yet we can distribute software that no one needs any training on? Fundamentally different way to think about the industry, the user experience. How can you create something so easy to use you don't need to train a workforce? How cool would that be in oil and gas? And last but not least, in the most important piece, uh, puzzle piece here, this is a people problem. It's not a technology problem. The challenge of adopting technology actually is about people. It's the soft stuff. Changing roles, changing jobs, attracting new talent, which is why SEPA Foundation had conversations today about the talent puzzle. How do you solve for this? Because this is part of the, part of the challenge. This framework applies no matter where you are in the oil and gas industry. Capital projects and construction, operations, Maintenance and repair, upgrades, abandonments, doesn't really matter. Everywhere you work in this, in this industry, this applies to you. It doesn't matter whether you're a supplier to the industry or if you're an actual operator in the industry, an end-to-end -end player, same work applies, same framework applies. Everywhere throughout. Many, many years ago, they, when the ISO standardization wave swept through the uh, manufacturing world, uh, some of the manufacturers simply said to their supply base, if you are not on ISO, XXX, you're no longer a supplier of ours. You've got to get onto ISO. That's where this digital world goes. If you're going to play with some of these really, really large companies, you're going to have to figure out how do I digitize up my company so that I can participate. Now, just for fun, um, <clears throat> everybody go grab their cell phone, please. Everybody get your cell phone. Get your browser out. Get your browser out. I know you all have phones because you're texting questions, so <laughs> get your cell phone out, go to your browser, open up Google Quick Draw. So just go to Google, 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 go to Google's homepage and type in Quick Draw. Anybody ever heard of Google Quick Draw before I do this exercise? Probably not, right? It's mostly for kids, but it's good fun. So Google Quick Draw is an artificial intelligence uh, learning system that Google has out online. And you are all going to participate now in Quick Draw. So what Quick Draw does is it says to you, I'll give you something to draw. And you use your finger to draw it on the screen. And it, Google then tries to figure out whether or not uh, what it is you're drawing, whether it can interpret it properly. You see how fast it works. Okay, it probably might ask you to say, draw a candle, draw a cantaloupe. What have you got, Carrie? Draw a newspaper. How quickly can you draw something that looks like a newspaper and Google Quick Draw says, oh, I think it's a newspaper? <laughs> Sorry, I got, <laughs> someone's drawing skills are really, uh, so what Google Quick Draw does, it's a neural, it's a learning, um, artificial intelligence learning system. You guys have just all participated as machine learning, by the way. <laughs> all right, step away from the phones. It's time to come back to the front. 
So there's a, uh, what, what's under the covers of that? It's an artificial intelligence uh, engine by Google, which is learning to interpret random finger drawings and guessing what those are based on thousands and thousands and thousands of iterations. <laughs> I know, too exciting. I have to turn the Wi-Fi off just to get this meeting back in order. Okay, tension. Eyes front. There's many different kinds and definitions of artificial intelligence. Let me just give you a couple so that you can kind of embed them in your thinking. But one is machine learning. And then machine learning is when you take a thousand pictures of forks and you show it to a computer and eventually it'll figure out a thousand picture in one. That's a fork. That's not a fork. That's, one, that's a brute force way to teach a computer to do something. And that's one, one method to, to get a, a computer to begin to, um, to, to be able to process um, uh, properly. Um, so that's what machine learning's, how machine learning work. Machine learning is not to be underestimated. If you took two Go computers, Go is an ancient uh, Asian strategy game, you put two Go computers, made them play each other, within a couple of hours, they're world-class experts. There are some computer games where they try and figure out, how do I create, um, a, the, uh, get the computers to uh, um, deal with reward theory? So they put two computers together, and they made them play one of those ping pong games where you get the paddles going like this. And the computers realized pretty quickly, I hate losing. And it's not as much fun beating the other guy over and over again. So they came up with their own strategy. This is two computers doing it on their own. No humans involved. Uh, the com computers decided, how long can we keep a rally going? That was way more entertaining for them than it was to actually beat the opponent. Once the computers start taking over and thinking differently, they'll come up with different strategies. And so this is kind of new in a uh, field of, of artificial intelligence and, and learning. Uh, but is how do you, how, how does you uh, get computers to take on and, and emulate some of the attributes of, of this, uh, how humans learn? Artificial intelligence in broad measure is merely machines that have and can process cognitively the kinds of things that we normally think of as being specific to humans. Eyesight, hearing, language interpretation, tool making. If, you've got, if you can have a machine that can emulate that, it's awfully close to artificial intelligence. We're surrounded by it at this stage. Siri on your phone, Google Home, the quick draw application. These tools are coming very, very fast. And because the machines teach each other so quickly, they learn so fast, the pace by which the artificially intelligent world is evolving is accelerating at a pace far beyond normal human learning speed. It takes us 15 years as humans just to learn what other humans have already learned through the school system. Machines do that much, much faster. Now, where is artificial intelligence in operations? Well, it principally is up in here. Uh, internet uh, things and uh, automation, auto, um, uh, taking the data from uh, the sensor devices and interpreting them, uh, everything from leak detection, flow monitoring, energy consumption, energy usage, and so forth. Uh, Google, just as an example, Google's engineers in their data centers are pretty smart guys. Uh, they figured that they had the best optimized en energy use in their data centers, and so they decided, um, just for fun, let's have our own art artificial intelligence engines have a crack at it. And the AI engines improved the data center operations by a further 20% energy use. Okay? If you've got engineers internally who say, no, 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 I'm on this, this can't be bettered, probably can. AI is, is tailor-made for interpreting huge amounts of data. In maintenance and repair, um, typ typical application in oil and gas is, is in the pigging and reliability, but the enormous amount of data that's uh, available inside pipelines about pipeline uh, integrity, um, metal fatigue, corrosions, and so forth, tailor-made for artificial intelligence applications. In 2017, just for fun, Microsoft ran a hackathon where they took a bunch of pipeline corrosion data, big Excel spreadsheet of some kind, 59,000 data points. They buried in it 3,000 uh, hidden corrosion incidences and then ran the hackathon just to see whether or not the population playing the hackathon could solve the problem. Artificial intelligence was able to pinpoint the 89 to 90% accuracy exactly when the pipe was uh, required a repair because they were able to find the data that the humans could not. Um, so a AI uh, in pipelines, um, uh, uh, well applied and, and uh, very, very valuable. In capital projects and upgrades, 
um, sensors and wearables and so forth, as we talked about, uh, a very, very high uh, application uh, rate. Um, but that's the, the main opportunity uh, in the pipeline industry, certainly at oil and gas as I see it, is absolutely going to be in the construction side. Enormous amounts of, of, of uh, downtime and wait time as uh, we wait for crews to show up and equipment to arrive and so forth. Um, uh, in my previous job, I was working in the LNG industry and uh, one of my Japanese colleagues came over from Japan uh, to uh, meet with me because they had been modeling out Canada's ability to deliver the LNG projects. And uh, they concluded uh, that Canada's construction industry is not capable of delivering an LNG uh, project at a world-class scale. And one of the reasons they said was, it's so completely not digital. Like it's, you know, the plants are digital, but, but the, the actual construction project itself is not. It, it actually labors under very manual ways of doing business. So the Japanese are suspicious of Canada's ability um, to deliver. Other places where um, the, these technologies can apply, um, we've uh, talked a little bit about this, wearables, um, fleet learning I've already mentioned, um, maintenance data in the cloud, um, energy trading, uh, VAKT, a name for you, you might want to write down. VAKT is a energy trading company startup in Europe. It's uh, nine organizations got together, including um, tank farms, pipelines, barge operators, port companies, and banks. And they're now going to start trading petroleum products on a blockchain platform. And they're going to bring this to North America um, later on next year. So blockchain is coming into oil and gas uh, through the uh, trading world. On the other creative technologies, not yet really talked about, but uh, 3D printing and printing of equipment, uh, spare parts and so forth, um, very much in vogue in Europe and have tremendous uh, impacts on uh, constructability of, um, of assets. So these, these technologies are critical to the productivity gain equation. Uh, and then gamification and cyber. Remember the training course that we saw, the auto augmented reality training course? That's a kind of gamification. You give, you give points to people for getting the job done right and, and uh, scoring their performance. You saw that gas gauge, right? That's a kind of gamification. We barely scratched the surface on how we could bring millennial-based game thinking into um, the industries that we're all working in today. Like how do you bring games into the, that operational, more operational world? The biggest worry, though, if you're a board of an oil and gas company, though, is new business models. What happens when you take that supply chain of, of uh, value chain of, uh, of, of a pipeline company, and what happens when you create a digital version of it? Then you start to optimize that, that uh, business in the cloud. And then what happens when you bring industry-wide data and industry-wide analytics to bear uh, to that same equation? What happens then? Big, big, big changes can come to how we think about um, the pipeline industry, product movement, product handling, shipping, logistics. And you might say, well, this is a bit of science fiction. Eh, not really. Uh, there's a company in Calgary called Stream Systems. They build digital twins of tank farms. And they show how the, the orthodoxies that companies have about how their own assets run don't work right when you could put, a, put them into an artificially intelligent machine. You, the machine finds much better ways to run the existing assets that we already have. They prove this over and over again. Tank farms, windmills, all sorts of different assets. Thought here is to liberate your data. If data is the currency, if bits and bytes are what's going to make those barrels more valuable, and you're sitting on oceans and oceans of data, how do you liberate that data? Our current model in oil and gas is, that's mine, it's proprietary, and I don't let you have it. How Silicon Valley and other industries look at this is they say, no, that, that, that data, well, let's liberate that data. Let's let crowds work with that data. Let's let our peers and colleagues look at that data. Let's see how we can use that data to make things better. The reason why they do this is because artificial intelligence and those machines, they're much better with more data. So if you're sitting on your pile of data, you're going to get two times the benefit if you just shared that data with just one other competitor with about the same time, size of data. You get it out to hundreds of companies, the impact is unimaginable. So you have to figure out ways, liberate your data. Now, let me leave you with this, some final thoughts. How do you get started? How do you become the hero in your industry? 
Number one, what's your digital North Star? I told you what Rio's digital North Star is. It's the other planets. I'm going to build the robots to go after the other planets. I'm going to solve for the Canadian and the North American the Earth challenge, but then my robots can go elsewhere. That's their North Star. There's a company in Africa. They said, you know what? We're going to be the first company to build an underground, fully automated mine. Underground, fully automated mine in Africa. That hotbed of digital innovation, high-tech capabilities, sophisticated supply chain. Africa are going to beat the rest of the world into the innovations of, of tomorrow. So set your digital North Star. When I say North Star, I mean it's, it's, not like it's, a, it's not like a line of sight. You can kind of stare at it. But you know what? Today I might have to go over here, and tomorrow I have to go over there. And your North Star is merely your directional setting. So in Rio's North Star is I've got to get people out of harm's way. No more worries about safety equipment. Let's just automate the work so I get the individuals out of harm's way entirely. That's their North Star. So you have to ask yourself, what's my North Star going to be? Next is you've got to educate your organization. Not only do we have to educate the population because of the innovation happening, we've got to educate our organizations. You can't do this alone. You've got to get your organizations behind you. This is about getting your boards involved, getting your other critical stakeholders, your workforce. You've got to get the education up to the same level of understanding of where this innovation potential takes us so that you can mobilize your organization to support the journey. Number three, build that business-driven roadmap. There's a lot of, I've shared a lot of technology with you today. Unless there's a compelling, hardcore, it's going to give me value either in cost or productivity, maybe carbon reduction, safety improvements, unless it's got a hardcore business benefit, don't do it. Find that business-driven roadmap. That's the one that's going to make you money. Next, raise your data acumen. You're sitting on an ocean of data. It's worth an enormous amount of money. Raise your acumen. Data scientists, insight, thinking about data. Where do I get value from my data? How does this data create value for me and my organization and more broadly? And last but not least, put the foundations in place. One of the foundation stones for the oil sands heavy haulers, telecommunications network. How do you run heavy haulers in a mine? Are you going to turn that over to uh, the teleco, TELUS? Right? Are you going to do this with Bluetooth? No. You're going to have to figure out some different technical solutions. Those are the technical foundations. Once you understand what your critical business roadmap is, the technical foundations become very evident. Very evident. In Rio's case, one of their technical foundations for their autonomous equipment, their underground fully autonomous mine, how do you charge underground mining equipment? How do you do that? Only people do that today. There's no known way to do that. They had to go and invent some solutions to do that. So they turned to their ecosystem and said, that's your job. Go and invent some technologies for us. Get your foundations in place. Ladies and gentlemen, bits bytes and barrels. They're no longer separate topics. It's all one thing. We need heroes. Go be the hero. Thank you very much. <laughs>